Thank you. Before we get started, just one thing. Someone left a book here and their survey last week, and it was about where Roy's sitting. It was on the table somewhere right along in there. Okay. They uh, they filled out their survey and left it. <coughs> but they didn't put the numbers on it, so um, I'm not sure what to do with. It. I'll I'll talk with you afterwards, Deanne. I just wanted to to mention that. Well, good morning. Good to see everybody. We'll get started again. We uh, we'll do a quick little review of what we covered last week, and then. Uh, and we'll pick up where we are today. So this is the second half of our lesson two on the Kalam cosmological argument. Next week will be a, a new lesson and we'll move on. There'll be more graphics on the wall to, to stimulate your mind and there'll be a new outline for everybody for next week. So um, but we started off, we have Michael in our mind. Michael says he doesn't believe in the Bible and Michael is the person that we're, we're trying to help. We're trying to help. He's got a dilemma because he doesn't believe in the truthfulness of the Bible and so his worldview is a false worldview and that's a dilemma that we're um, encouraged by Scripture, commanded by Scripture to address. And so he's our focus. We're also doing this to help our own faith, you know, to invigorate and to strengthen our own faith. So that's our purpose here. So, we need to start somewhere with people like Michael, the Michaels of the world that don't believe in the Bible. And so, one of the best places to start is to start with the argument about how the cosmos came into, came into being. And we've started that with the Kalam cosmological argument, and it is, it is a very, uh, very much a... <clears throat> let me get through these. Very much a... Uh, philosophical argument and we had said that <clears throat> that the way that the argument is that, that we that we can structure these arguments is just to pre present premises and then from these premises we dig in deeper to determine whether those premises are true. And so our overall premise for the course is God exists and Christianity is true. And so that's what we're working through methodically uh, throughout all of these classes to present evidence to, to, to uh, prove that uh, opening statement. But in the Kalam cosmological argument, this opening statement is that anything that begins to exist has a cause. And then we said the earth begins to exist and then the conclusion is therefore the earth or the universe had a cause. And so it's a real simple philosophical question. We talked about no one disputes the first premise that everything that begins to exist has a cause. And we, we thought about that and we talked about that. No one disputes that that's true. Nothing just comes into existence on its own. And so we got through that first premise and we said, yes, that's true. The second premise that we, can, we, that we come to is that <clears throat> the universe had a cause or that the universe began to exist. As we say, the universe had a beginning and so then that runs into all the arguments that the atheists put together because of the implication of the universe having a beginning. And so they are, their natural default position, non-believers, is that the universe has been here forever. It's existed forever. It, therefore, it needs no creator. It's just something that's always been. And so we run into several points of opposition there that we need to look at. And so the way we do that is we start looking at some different things to argue against the idea of a universe that's being here forever. And if you remember, one of the first things that we looked at was the, the impossibility of an actual infinite set. And we said that, you know, in set theory within mathematics, you know, you, you can't have a closed set of an infinite number of things because you can potentially keep adding to it. So it's a potentially closed set of infinite things, but it's not an actual closed set. And since it's only a potential infinite set, it, th there cannot be uh, infinity going into the past. There can be infinity going into the future. 
things could go on forever, but you can't have an infinity going into the past. We brought another example up that you can't traverse an infinite number of events. And we look, talked about these footsteps, and these footsteps have a, a story behind them. And you see they start over there at one point. And so you walk and you walk and you walk and you can walk to eternity, which is what we're going to do as Christians. We're going to walk to eternity hand in hand with Christ and with our fellow brothers. The naturalists say that we've walked forever. Essentially, the universe has walked forever. The universe has always existed. So if you think about this being a timeline, and if I get on this footprint right here and I turn around and I walk back the other way, I can never get to the beginning if the universe has always been here. Because it goes on, in their mind, it goes on to infinity. I can never walk that far back. And if it works in that direction, it works in the opposite direction. If I'm at infin infinity past, I cannot walk through all of the events, through an infinite number of days and events to get to today. You can't traverse an infinite number of events. And the fact that we are here today, that we are in this classroom, means that we started somewhere and we've walked all of these steps. We, didn't, we, we, we hadn't walked from eternity because we could never get here. So that's the second point that we brought out. Then we said that the, uh, that the universe began to exist. And then we said the next point was that we have learned a lot from the Hubble telescope and what the Hubble telescope has told us uh, about the universe and about uh, s some of the things that we can assume that happened in the very beginning when, when God said, let there be light that very instant that everything began, that all the matter was created and energy and all of that. So the Hubble telescope can look at the light that's coming from the distant stars and can tell, number one, whether the, those stars are moving toward the earth or away from the earth. Those that are moving toward the earth compress the light wavelength and so it moves the, the blue light to a place where it's usually not, not supposed to be, where it's not supposed to be on the, the spectrum of light. But what we're interested in is the redshift. And what they see is this light coming from these distant stars. They can look at like a rainbow as the spectrum of colors. And the red, instead of being here, is shifted over here. And they say, well, it's shifted over there because of the speed that it's traveling and the distance that it's traveling. And they can determine the speed and the distance that that star is traveling based upon how much it shifted that red light. And so they do that and they determine, hey, these stars are all moving and they're moving away. Which means, if you think about that backwards, at one time they were all closer and closer and closer and closer and closer together. So you think about an explosion. Let there be light. Boom and everything explodes, the stars are blowing out, they're moving, the matter that formed the stars is all moving out. And so we can tell that since they're moving out, and since the universe is expanding, and since it is still expanding, and it hadn't collapsed and died and all of that, that it came from an infinitely small beginning. Like we said, like a big bang. Atheists said Big Bang and we screamed about it for years and years and now after Hubble and all this data and all this information, the atheists say Big Bang and we go, yeah, let there be light. That's a Big Bang. And so we're on the same wavelength with the atheists as far as the beginning of the earth. So we look at the expansion of the universe. We looked at the redshift. Hubble has also seen at the very far edges of the universe, as far out as they can see, that there's ripples in what's called the space-time fabric of the universe. This, out at the very edge, there's these waves that they can detect with the, with the uh, Hubble telescope, and these waves are very much similar to the waves when you drop a pebble in a pond of water, and they ripple out, 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 out. And if you've ever seen an explosion in super, super slow motion, you can see the shock waves move out and out and out, and these are waves. And they see that on the very extreme edges of the universe as far out as they can see that there's these waves. That's another reason that tells 
scientists that all of this started from a very small, tiny beginning that it hadn't been here forever. And so we looked at, this is a model, this is kind of how they see it, and this is the, the waves. And so I said I wanted to get into the last argument. And, uh, but before we do that, we said that uh, the universe began to exist. An infinite number of events cannot be traversed. The universe is expanding from a definite beginning. And so the last that I want to present is an argument from the second law of thermodynamics. And this law says total entropy of an isolated system can never decrease. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. What that really means is that differences in temperature and pressure and in density tend to even out over time. So I've got a cup of coffee here, and it was hot when I put it in the cup a little bit ago. But if I let this cup set here long enough, eventually this cup will give up all its heat to the atmosphere, to this temperature in the room, and the cup will be, the coffee will be, become the same temperature as the room that it loses its temperature, that it becomes the same as the room. The room absorbs that little bit of heat, but the temperature in the room doesn't go up because the room is so large. But they eventually become the same temperature. And that happens with all systems. They eventually equal out and they reach a balance and everything becomes the same. It happens in the world. It happens in the universe. It's a place of peace where everything lines out and all becomes the same. Your coffee cup, the same thing happens in the universe with the stars. And so if you take that same idea, there's a limited supply of fuel that the stars have. The stars are filled up with gas just like you go and you fill your car up with gas. They burn so long then they burn out and die. The fact that the stars are still shining that they still have energy means that they had a definite starting point that the stars haven't been here forever. How many of you have heard of the heat death of the universe? The only science fiction talks about heat death of the universe. It's actually not science fiction. Even the atheist science, scientists agree that there will come a point in the world at some point in the universe where all the stars will have to run out of their hydrogen. Most of their fuel is hydrogen. They'll burn up all their hydrogen. And they'll give up all their heat to the universe. The universe is, is huge. It's a cold vacuum. And it'll absorb all that heat that's come off of all of these stars. And then the whole universe will be black and freezing cold and no stars. And they call that the heat death of the universe. Millions of years or tomorrow, whenever God decides that's the end. If that's how he decides it ends, that, that would be how it ends. But the fact that we're still here, the stars are still burning, tells us that there was a point in past time that they were filled up with fuel. And so the universe had a beginning because of that. Even the atheists, this really aggravates them. Paul Davies is, a, is an atheist, cosmologist, uh, astrophysicist, whatever he is, that has written a lot against Christianity and uh, is, a, is a real critic of, of Christianity. And he writes this, even though we may not like it, we must say that the universe's energy was somehow put in at the creation as an initial condition. Boy, that, that's full of nice words. <laughs> You know, the, the universe's energy was somehow put in, this is a quote from him, at the creation as an initial condition. Not, not forever, past. There was an initial condition at the creation and the universe's energy was put in. So what we can say is the universe is expanding from a definite beginning. We said that there's an infinite number of Events cannot be traversed, and this last one, thermodynamics, shows that the universe had a beginning. And so, in our study, we've said what begins to exist has a cause. We said that's correct. The universe began to exist, and we've looked at three points. There are several others from science 
Several others from reasoning, where we could say, yes, you know, that's true, the universe began to exist. And then the last one, therefore, the universe has a cause. And so that's the logic of it. That's the, the supporting evidence, some of the supporting evidence around the, uh, the argument. This argument's been around, as I said, for years and years, thousands of years. Uh, William Lane Craig has really made it popular. If you want to read more about it, he would be a, a great one to, to read about. He's done a lot of work on this. And so our conclusion to the whole matter is that the universe had a beginning. It had a cause. And so that's the conclusion of our argument. And so what do we do with that? You know, it, it's, it's, we can't say that's the father of Jesus. All we can say at this point from that evidence is just that there was a cause that caused the universe to exist. And remember, we're talking to Michael, right? So we're trying to ease Michael into this. So what does this do for our argument? I've said we're, we're creating a Christian worldview. At the very beginning, we talked about worldviews and that we answer the three big questions in a particular way because we have a Christian worldview. Michael answers those questions in a completely different way because he doesn't have a Christian worldview. And so we're building a Christian worldview portrait as we go along. These things that we learn and we find out, looking at this from a, from a, a, you know, a secular point of view so that we can engage with Michael, this common ground, we're building this Christian worldview so that we understand and to track what we're doing. That's these, the picture frame over there, and that'll be progressive as well. There'll be more picture frames, and we'll fill that out as we go. So we have, we're building this Christian worldview portrait. We'll add some information each time we finish a lesson. So here's what we can determine. According to Paul, God has revealed himself in the things that have been created. We talked about that last Sunday morning, and I mentioned it again last Sunday night. That's one of our, our proof texts for uh, why we're doing apologetics, why, where we have warrant to do apologetics. Paul has revealed himself in the things that have been created. So since we can use that information to help us determine some characteristics about God. Remember, Paul said that we can determine some of his invisible attributes namely His eternal power and His divine nature. Paul says that in Scripture. Romans 1.19 We can determine some of these things from nature. So we've just gone through the first argument. So what are some things we can determine about God from nature and from this argument that we've just looked at? The first thing we can say is He's uncaused. The first cause had no cause. And, and Sonny brought up a, a good point last week about time. And we talked about, you know, God basically created time when He created matter. You can't have time without matter. You can't have, you know, time without uh, an object. You have to have matter. Time came into being when creation came about. There's no past for God. There's no future for God. He lives in the eternal present in His, in his realm. He's in our in our temporal present and future in our past, but in His realm, and He's in the eternal present. Everything's the present. Everything's already happened. We watch a parade and we watch the band go by, the horses go by, the ambulance go by, the fire truck, and we watch it all go by like this. God sees the start and the end of the parade at the same time. He's forever in the present in all things. And that is because He's uncaused and that way he has he is he is uh, he is uncaused. So that's always the question, right? Who created God? So God created the universe. Well, who created God? Well, nobody created God because something outside of time doesn't have to have a creator. He can be eternally eternal because he's in the eternal presence. So that's one thing we can say. He's beginningless, and that's another way of basically saying the same thing. The first, that's because the first cause is uncaused. He's changeless. This gets back to a series of infinite events. So a series of infinite changes cannot be traversed either. 
If God had existed from all beginning and was changeable and could change as time went on, He could never get to the point to where He is today because He could never go through all of those changes to get there. So it's the same, the same idea. And so He's changeless. He's unchanging. The same yesterday, today, and forever. We can say that He is immaterial. And that's because all materials change on an atomic or molecular level to some degree. You know, there's a change in the position of the electrons around an atom from moment to moment to moment. Those are changes. God is unchanging in, in every respect. And so, He is immaterial. He is, that means He is a spirit only and no body. He's timeless, given that time had no beginning. Spaceless, since the first cause is both immaterial and timeless, he takes up no space. And so he is spaceless as well. And he is enormously powerful by virtue of creation ex nihilo or out of nothing. And so those are some things that we can get out of this argument that we've presented about God. We could say that he is personal, and this is an important one. This is a a characteristic that Paul says that you know, is one of his divine attributes, one of his invisible powers, his divine attributes, and that he is a personal being because it was only the personal vol volition or free will of an uncaused first cause can account for the first change initiated by a changeless cause. That sounds like wording in a circle, but... That's the preciseness of it. The God of pantheism is eliminated here. So as I said, we can't say this is the father of Jesus yet, but we can say this is not the Hindu God. This is not the God of Buddha. So all of those are eliminated because the creator and the creation cannot be one and the same. The Hindu and the Buddhist believe God is everywhere and God is everything. God is a rock. God is in the rock. You know, in nirvana is when you become God yourself. And you become a rock with God. And you are God. And that's pantheism. And, uh, and that's, this is eliminated by that. So we can say, okay, so we've elim eliminated pantheism. And so, so we end up with, we can say this about our Christian worldview at this point. We can say that there exists an uncaused personal creator of the universe who in relation to the universe is beginningless, changeless, immaterial, timeless, spaceless, and enormously powerful. <clears throat> Those are some invisible attributes and some of the eternal power of God that Paul says we can determine through nature and this we've been able to determine from our first lesson. So, I would like to open it up. That's the end of our Kalam cosmological argument. I'd like to open it up for a few minutes and, and see if what your thoughts are, what your comments are. Any questions? Come on now. <laughs> Those of us who deal with time have trouble de determining, you know, dealing with something that does not that is timeless. And is not bounded by time. Right. And, you know, even God in His Word says, you know, at just the right time, He brought out this. And He deals with us in our time space continuum, but He can be in anywhere in that time frame at any time and all time. And that's hard for us to imagine being finite creatures. Yeah. Is, in, is determining the infinite. And we can't. I mean, we can't. We can't envision eternity. Right. And so therefore we have trouble envisioning someone who can be at all places at all times with everybody in their time space continuum. That he can. Yeah, exactly. And you know, our song this morning, that amazing grace, when we've been here ten thousand years, and I thought, ten thousand years? I thought, well, that's just a sliver of eternity. I mean, we just don't have any concept of of eternity and, and things outside of time. You know, get confusing and get hard for us to hard for us to wrap our minds around, and it takes quite a bit of thought for us to to work through that stuff. But uh, yeah, he's outside of outside of time. 
he makes his presence felt in our time, and he, uh, you know, he can move between the two realms, uh, you know, with ease. And uh, we're bound and limited to this realm, so uh, we can't can't time travel. Of course, Einstein said that if you traveled fast enough, you could look in a mirror and not see yourself. So you could, you could actually outrun your, you could outrun your own image if you can go fast enough. So, any other thoughts or questions? The one thing we know about man's science or human science is that it's continually right, it's continually wrong, and even things that they say uh, about the Bible that are wrong have eventually been proven right. And it makes a bigger splash whenever they say it's wrong than whenever they come back around and say, no, we were wrong, it's right. Uh, one thing as an uh, adult that you want to teach all young people is to question everything. And because if you don't question everything, we would still be believing that the world is flat regardless of what the Bible says to Yeah. Uh, we would believe that uh, all the advancements that they made in medicine, we would have stopped at a certain point and said science says this is it. Anything that we've done in this world that has been created is because somebody questioned, is that it? And, and uh, as someone that's, uh, I don't remember exactly who the comedian was, but the comedians were adamant about being atheists. And they said, if you're, you know, we tell everybody that we don't believe in God. Why, if you are a Christian, don't you tell everybody that you do believe in God? We don't understand that. Yeah. And uh, so he says, if you believe in something, tell somebody you believe in something. Let them prove you wrong. Yeah. And so as adults <coughs> and as young people, I don't care what your professor says. I don't care what anybody tells you. Question it. Prove it to be right. You may find a different way. You know, mathematics, how far is it advanced from the, the origin? Right. Every, how far is everything advanced from the origin because somebody says something <clears throat> Now, and our, the Bible is continually proved over and over and over again, things that they said. <coughs> and, be, you know, I, and I know I'm, I'm circling back around saying the same identical thing again, but we have to, and this is great for us, Tammy, told me, she said, I'm not sure I'm going to get this. And I said, well, you, it will come together. You'll get it. And it, and it's, it is way advanced. Uh, and, and I studied what apologetics mean. Uh, yet, whenever we got home, I started studying that, just that aspect of it from the worldly view, not from the godly view. I started studying that aspect of it. Uh, and I'd never really looked at things that way. I know we, we've had the, the muscle and shovel type book to where uh, they had, took a guy that had a basic belief and changed his belief. So yeah. we're talking about people that have no belief or in God or their belief is that there's no God. Right. And, and it's going to be... Uh, uh, we always have to use the term buy-in, I guess. And I think that we have to wholeheartedly uh, throw ourselves into this and say, look, there are a lot of people that may say they believe in God, but they really limit God. And uh, I think this right here in what you're teaching is going to uh, just blow that out of water. Yeah. We are going to have... Uh, the tools, even if we're not able to use the tool, we're going to have those tools and that yeah. knowledge. Yeah, I think that, you know, that's the, one of the big purposes of apologetics. It's twofold. It's to reach the people, you know, the Michaels of the world that I keep referring to. It's, it's to reach those people, but it's also incredibly important for, for ourselves uh, to ask those questions. I think uh, if you were here last Sunday, I'd said that Virgil Trout once said, if Christianity is true, then it will not be harmed by being investigated. And that's true. Uh, and and what, all we can do is grow from it uh, because the more you learn about something, the more you, the more you love it. You know, part of our, our worship of God is, is love for God. Big part of it is. You can't love, any, can't love anything or anyone unless you know about it. 
And the more you know about it, the more that you love it. So knowledge certainly helps us. But, you know, all of us have some, I don't understand this. Well, how can, th this doesn't make sense. You know, what about this? And then there's the vulnerable, you know, that go to college, the young people especially that go off to college and then a professor stands before them that's got PhD after his name and he starts telling all that's bunk. And, you know, so it becomes real important to be able to counter those arguments as well. But, you know, the apostles wanted us to, and, and God himself, let us reason together. Let us put our minds to this. Let us think through this. If he didn't want us to reason through things, he would have made it a whole lot more easy, a whole lot easier. You know, the Bible would be this thick and would answer every possible question you could ever think of. Part of spiritual growth is this meditating. And I don't mean like, oh, um, meditating. I'm talking about in your, in your prayer closet when you think about just a phrase that, that, that's out of Scripture. You know, meditate on that. Think on that. What, is that, what are the implications of that? What does that mean? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What does that mean? Wow. You know, meditate on that. How deep is that? You know, what, you know, uh, uh, different things and uh, different passages through Scripture. And so that meditation is a big part of our, of our edification among ourselves. Uh, I enjoy talking with a lot of y'all about, you know, your thoughts around a passage or a particular thought, that edification that comes from that. And it's a, it's a praise to God to study more deeply. And uh, I think apologetics can help us do that. Um, like I say, we're eventually going to get to the Bible, the authority of the Bible. You know, that ties all of it back together. But with some people, it takes us a while to get there, to, to start with, you know, what we might call, you know, just this common ground that I've been talking about. So that, uh, that it's not so... And not so tough. Just this is off track just a little bit, but I want to mention this. So there's like five different approaches you can take, major approaches you can take to apologetics, to teaching apologetics, or presenting apologetics. And then there's maybe a hundred different combinations you can do. And you know the old adage: listen first and then speak. So you listen to a person and then you determine which approach is better. But for teaching a class to go through this is is much better. One of the methods of teaching apologetics or approaching apologetics is called a, an evidentialist approach where you use evidence as evidentialist approach. An evidentialist approach start with the resurrection. Now the resurrection is our, our peak, right? That's, that's, that's our apex of our belief. But if you start there with someone like Michael, you immediately run into problems because the first thing you have to do is you have to get them to buy into the supernatural. And, and that, that's, now you're right back to square one. You're just one step away from being out of the game again. So Michael comes and says, I don't believe in the Bible, the authority of the Bible, and you're an evidentialist. And you say, well, let me tell you about Jesus. He's the Son of God, and God raised Him from the dead. Whoa. Now you're asking me to believe in a miracle. I don't believe in miracles either. So... So that's how an evidentialist approaches it. These cumulative cases seem like it's, it's going to be low, uh, slow and, and drug out and painful. But, but I promise you, we're, we're going to get to the authority of Scripture. That's where all of our truth is, but we've got to get those people to that to begin with. So we've got several more weeks before we get there. When we get to the resurrection, the resurrection we're going to approach it from a purely historical standpoint. And... Uh, so that'll be much more interesting than some of this stuff may be and be much more interesting and, and easier to understand but but we've got to get there and we've got to get there in a proper way I've got a little bit of time so I want to move ahead I am uh, I'm about three weeks ahead of us in writing these lessons and the lessons that I'm working on right now I'm going oh this is too long oh this is too long so I'm going to try to capitalize on this extra time this morning. Thank goodness our preacher this morning didn't yak like the guy last week. <laughs> that guy last week just talks and talks and talks. So I appreciate Alan for keeping us on time. You don't have an outline, you'll have it on your desk when you come in next Sunday morning for lesson three. Uh, we'll be, we'll, um, 
really begin digging into it next, next week, but I want to go ahead and start in it. We'll do a review at the start of next week after you have your notes so you can make, make notes with it. But we're going to look at the teleological argument. And so what we've said is that from the Kalam argument, we've learned that there was some things about the nature of God, some of His attributes, and those develop questions, right? So we have this, this, this idea of God so far that says there exists an uncaused personal creator of the universe who in relation to the universe is beginningless, changeless, immaterial, timeless, spaceless, and enormously powerful. So we got that out of that first argument. And so th that, that's kind of generic. We we're going to build on that. But that should drive us to ask further questions. So one of the questions should be, so exactly what did he create? And how did he create it? Not, not did he snap his fingers or not did he clap his hands or not did he yell out, let there be light, but, but how did he create the things that are created? How are they constituted? You know, how, how are those things put together? How are those things made? That should be questions, the next questions that come along. Okay? He created the universe. There is a creator. He's not the God of pantheism. But, and He created. So what did He create? How did He create it? And so if we start to look at that way, we can say that, end of lesson two, I always get ahead of myself. So we can say that if we want to study about a creator, we need to look at what he's created. If you want to know something about Vincent van Gogh, you need to study Starry Night. Is that right, Linda? <laughs> so you need to study about that. You can study about you know, his, his methods. You can study about how he uses a brush. You can think something about what might be going on in his mind. You can look at the proportions, his choice of colors, how everything's laid out. You can determine something about Van Gogh by looking at that portrait. Yes, ma'am. Well, I was just holding my finger thinking to myself that Van Gogh was considered kind of crazy. You know that. He was. I am too. <laughs> so... <laughs> He wants to cut his ear off. <laughs> and he didn't get it put Don't back on. That. Don't do that. And they didn't put it back on either, so. <laughs> anyway, you know, so we can, we can study things about the Creator by looking at the creation. And that's what we've said, right? In Romans, we can look at the created things in the world. There was a man named William Paley years and years and years ago. William Paley was an English clergyman. He was a Christian apologist. And he was a philosopher. And he's best known for his argument for God that's called the watchmaker argument. William Paley basically said, if you're walking through the woods and you see a rock in the woods, you walk upon it and you go, okay, that's a rock. It belongs here. looks like everything else. That's a rock. <clears throat> If you're walking through the woods and you walk upon a watch, you say, that doesn't belong here. And not only that, but somebody created that. There's evidence of design there. There's thought there. There's intention there. There's intentionality. There was a, a, a creator that thought through this out and put this all together. And this, this doesn't belong here. This is something that's been created. It's not something that's just natural. And that's called the watchmaker argument. We've said that. Um, we've said that our opening statement is that God exists and Christianity is true. And we looked at these arguments from the Kalam cosmological argument. And those arguments go back, as I said, to Plato and Aristotle, who observed that, you know, there's there's the created cosmos shows some kind of design. Now Aristotle and Plato, Socrates, none of them believed in the God of theism. They didn't believe in the God of Christianity. Christ hadn't come yet. They didn't believe, you know, they weren't Jewish. They were pagan Roman philosophers, but they could look at the skies and they could say, you know, there's, something did that. 
And you heard, you've heard the phrase, the unmoved mover. It was Aristotle said, there's something that moved, that moved all of this, that created all of this, the unmoved mover. So they began to study the cosmos and they said because of what we can see and because of this movement and this precision that all this stuff has, something did this. Some higher being, some supernatural being created all of this and so that's as far as they took it. But they said you can tell by the cosmos, you can tell by the fine tuning that we see in the universe that has been created. And so there are a couple of arguments that we make within the teleological argument. And the first part of them come from the cosmos and the, what's called the fine-tuning argument. That the universe is so finely tuned, it has to be the work of a creator. It's not just random. It has to be. We'll go through uh, some of this fine-tuning here in just a minute. The other argument comes from uh, biological systems and the intricacy that, that we see in biological systems, in human beings, you know, in our eyeball, uh, how complex some of these biological uh, systems are. Photosynthesis is one that's a complex. And so there's two different categories. So this lesson I broke up into two parts. The first week, which will be next week, is the, on teleology is on the uh, cosmos and the fine-tuning of the cosmos. And then the next week, week after next, we'll look at biological systems and how we see design in those systems. We'll be able to make more statements about the divine attributes of God that can clearly be seen in the world around us and we'll continue on that way. And so, like I said, we're making the statement God exists and Christianity is true. And we're making these arguments and everything that we say, it's like a court case, is all pointing toward that. So we've done that. Our next argument is the teleological argument. And we're going to keep arguing the same point. And it's the fine-tuning argument. And we said that the universe had a beginning. Scientific discovery over the last 30 years, again, what we've seen through the Hubble telescope and, and many different scientific experiments confirm the fact that we just see a lot of fine-tuning in the atmosphere, in the, in the universe. And of those, there are, there are several different forces that that we'll look at. There's, there's many, many arguments, but we're going to look at four of them is all. But we can start with the same kind of argument. So we, it's, a, it's another simple philosophical argument. Every design had a designer. The universe has a highly complex design. Therefore, the universe had a designer. So we'll do the same thing here. Every designer had a design. We'll look at that, say yes or no, is that true? The universe is highly complex in design. We'll look at evidence for that to support that and then that should lead us to the conclusion that the universe had a designer with a capital D. As I said there's four primary forces that we'll look at and I'm probably going to stop here but the strong nuclear force constant, the weak nuclear force constant, gravitational constant, and electro force constant and unless you're a science geek this is probably going to be a boring section for you but it's fascinating, the numbers that, that come out of it and the things that make you think about uh, make you think about are really well. These are four components that show us how much fine-tuning that there is in the universe as a whole. Um, but there are... I'm trying to think. I'll bring a handout next week. I think there's 35 or 40 different items that they've, they've identified uh, that are fine-tuning points in the universe. And so we'll get into those next week. But these are things like, uh, you know, these force constants, how atoms hold together. You know, if, if the force was any weaker, they would fall apart. If it was any stronger, they couldn't bond with, uh, you know, and so on and so on and so forth. You could never get from an atom to anything. You know, everything is made up of atoms. And so these, these forces are in a very tight range and if they're outside of that range that they exist in life wouldn't exist. Gravitational forces is, is an example. If you if you 
manipulate the gravitational force by the tiniest amount, all the planets in the orbits go out of whack. It just it just messes everything. It just implodes. It's like something traveling at a at a real high speed, and it gets a little bit out of balance, and it just catastrophic. That's what gravity does to keep the cosmos running the way that it is. And if if, if it's plus or minus that tiny little fraction, then then it couldn't be. And so the atheist says it just happened that way. 35 different coincidences that are so finely tuned and all 35 have to be perfectly precise for us to be standing here today and it just kind of happened that way. You know, just kind of by luck. That's what they say. So I'll try to work out the odds of that. If you've just on those 35, there's a lot more than that that need to be discovered, but I, you know, the odds of us being here and all 35 of those lining up are enormously small. And we'll get to that. I've got some, some numbers that will blow your minds because of the zeros. <laughs> One. So that's how fine-tuned it is. Any last questions? We've got about two minutes left. Any comments? Any thoughts? What about Lamanon? Well, Lamanon's interesting. Lamanon is, uh, I, th I think they make more out of that than it, than it really is. I think that's a neat, a neat thing. I think it's impressive to put up on a screen and to, to show that, but, but that is a base structure in biology that, that has a function that you can't argue that with an atheist. Because he says, yeah, okay, but you know, it's like a helical structure. It's like a, you know, it's a space-saving structure. There's no other way to, to spatially connect cells together than to use a, a, a cross to do that connection. It's the most efficient means by way to, that's how they argue it. So I think it's I think it's neat. It's all part of our design. God designed all of us. I think it's a neat argument. So what he's talking about, if you don't know, is is uh, is is it's a it's a connective tissue that connects cells together, and it's in the shape of a cross. When you look at it on an electron microscope and you pull it up, it looks like this cross. And you say, look, God's holding everything together. Is what. Some apologists say, they say, look, God holds every cell together in your body. God's in every cell holding it together with the, with the cross. And like I said, it's, it's a neat thing to look at. And, you know, it's, 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 it's powerful in some cases. But if you're talking to, to you know, a, a, an atheist or a Michael of the world or, or, or somebody that's, that's got some biological background, they'll eat that up. And so... One thing I'll say, and y'all don't crucify me, but we, uh, we, we sometimes present these arguments in favor of God, and we do more damage than we do good. This is not necessarily one of them, but it just brought this to mind. And through my education, through my schooling, they've cautioned us about not doing more damage by making a bad argument. You know, sometimes we can, you know, all the apostles, we'll get into this in several weeks, all the apostles died were martyred. Every single one of them was martyred. Well, there's not proof of that. And if you start to argue that, they'll eat you alive with it and you lose credibility because you've pushed an argument too far Say all oh, the apostles died. Oh, there's no record of it. Maybe, but there's no record of it. So, um, so th there's things like that. And so when we look through these arguments, we need to think about What's the counter argument that's going to come back to me? What are they going to say in return? And then how do I respond to that? And how do I, you know, how do I, I, how do I answer that? In other words, but but I've I've seen a, a demonstration on that lamin, and it's it's really cool what he does. And for Christians, it's yeah, it it gives you chills and, and makes you yeah. So you're right. It's got a lot of power if you're a Christian watching it. But in in an argument with Michael. Uh, yeah, they will eat you alive on that one. So, any other questions, or thoughts, or comments? Anything we can do better? The class. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I cut you off. No, you're good. I was just thinking of uh, biological biological design and the Creator's influence when you mentioned atoms. You know that say if you blow an atom up to the size of a baseball field, the nucleus is only the size of a BB. So the vastness of empty space in, inside just an atom even reflects on everything how you know moons and uh, solar systems and 
you know, the design of the universe. Right, so right. Yeah, everything has a... core, it reflects, you know... Everything has a, a perfect design. I know the bell's going to ring. I'll show you this. I love water. We all should love water. So that's water, chemically. Water is really unique in a lot of ways. That bond angle is 105 degrees. That's the angle between those two bonds. If you change that bond angle, the tiniest amount, water's not water anymore. That's biological fine tuning. Why did randomness pick 105 degrees for the bond angle for water? If you don't have that, you know, water makes a meniscus in a test tube where it humps up. You can lay a pen on top of water. That surface tension is created all because of that 105 degree angle. Uh, water rising in a column, the same thing. Water expanding and forming a lattice uh, structure when it freezes, all has to do with the 105 degree bond angle on that. So it's all through biology, it's all through chemistry, it's all through every single aspect of life. We could go on for 50 years talking about the evidence for God in every tiny little thing, but you know, that's, that's to me, that's one that's never mentioned. Uh, I, I, a lot of my chemistry is around water, so I love water. And, uh, you know, that's one that I'm partial to, but, but it's just, you can go on and on. Biff knows way more, Dr. Clark, uh, Kim, some of you other people in the medical field know how, how extensive a lot of this stuff is. So, anyway, I've gone past time. Thank you all for your attention. Please continue to feedback to the elders, good, bad, whatever. If any of you still have uh, surveys to turn in, please get those back to me. And we'll start again on lesson three next week.